first of all, uh, I, I'm working on a, a book, well, another book, uh, hopefully uh, some people will read it. Uh, I just actually finished a book on, uh, co-wrote a book on white supremacy in Ohio, uh, and uh, linking it, of course, to uh, the president, the resident. Uh, you may recall the Daily Stormer, the key neo-Nazi site, was in Columbus, Ohio, Worthington, and the guy who uh, uh, ran the woman over and killed the activist was also from Ohio. Uh, but Ohio has a very nasty history. But the one I'm working on actually uh, basically argues that the United States is not a democracy for the simple reason it doesn't have transparency uh, in its voting. Uh, and it goes through uh, a process. Uh, but one of two things happened in Ohio within the last few days. Uh, some of you probably know about it. Uh, number one, uh, they're purging 235,000 uh, voters uh, in Ohio. Uh, one of the reasons the Voting Rights Act was struck down was because Ohio had done mass purges uh, similar and they were across the Mason-Dixon line. So again, they 305,000 voters overwhelmingly uh, Democratic, Blacks, minorities, the poor in the 2004 election. Uh, then 1.25 million, of course, in the uh, uh, 08 election. Uh, many of them were re-registered, uh, thanks in part to a grant from Lori Grace, where we actually, we were the only people in the state uh, that got the data of the names. Uh, and, and there was a group that used to exist called ACORN that actually asked us for the names and went door to door and re-registered many of these people. Uh, so, uh, you've had that problem, then the next year, 2012, 1.1 million people purged. And I know that, you, you know, there's a good reason for these purges. Number one, there's a thing called a computer and there's not enough room to keep these names. Uh, two, everyone's required to have ID. Three, 80 percent of the people have not moved out of the county. They've changed their address. And the state knows who in the hell they are and where they are because of the tax records. So essentially, uh, instead of just putting didn't vote in the last two elections, they deregister them and purge them in an ID state which has computers with the capacity to hold their names. There is no logical reason on earth to purge these people. They know where they are for warrants. They know where they are for tax purposes. Sure there is. They vote wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> Voting while black. Okay, I get the point. They're illegal, they're illegal aliens. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're not allowed. They're not supposed to vote. Um, but these people, they know if these people are, re uh, are, are residents are required. They're, uh, you, you have to show uh, your ID and it matches with other records. So there are, uh, shockingly, most studies indicate that people are Ill illegal aliens. The last place on earth they go is to do something illegal uh, where there's police nearby. Uh, in fact, they sort of hide from that situation. Uh, now, the, uh, a variety of things uh, that I briefly wanted to touch on. Uh, they're also cutting back on poll workers. There's only going to be two poll workers at multiple precinct districts. Now, the multiple precinct districts are overwhelmingly in the black areas where you do four precinct at once. So the areas that waited from three to seven hours in 2004, because uh, there wasn't as, uh, enough machines, now will not have enough poll workers. And we know, uh, and again, this is uh, an easy process. If you want to gain the system, you back the lineup because you know, we vote on a work day, uh, you know, for the most part, and many people are poor and handicapped. So they're actually cutting back primarily in the urban area uh, on the amount of poll workers. But in the white affluent suburbs, there'll be plenty of poll workers 
four per poll. Uh, and again, they'll say, well, in a lot of elections, there's not a big turnout in the urban area. Yeah, yeah. The one exception is called the presidential election. So, uh, one of the things uh, we'd have looked at if we'd uh, uh, seen uh, the exit polls, uh, which suggested uh, uh, many things in Wisconsin uh, that Hillary Clinton won. <coughs> but uh, is that those things uh, are red flags. Uh, some of you know, uh, for example, that the uh, United States, uh, the State Department, and the U.S. Agency on International Development uh, look for statistical clues as to what are rigged elections overseas. But thankfully, we don't apply them here in the United States yeah, right. because of the primary uh, election. Uh, you would have had at least four states that voted for Hillary Clinton uh, that would have uh, been red flagged. And clearly, uh, in the election of Trump, uh, you had 24 out of 28 states in question uh, that would have been red flagged because of uh, the standard deviations, right? uh, being three or more uh, outside uh, what is predictable. So you have these outliers, these statistics that indicate your vote count makes no sense. Now, if we were social scientists, uh, we would do the following, which we don't do here, uh, but we got some technology Steve was pointing at uh, that allows us to actually uh, check some of these things. But here's what we would do. When we would have a statistically deviant election, when you would look at the stats and says that makes no sense. She's supposed to be winning by 10. She lost by 10. That's, you know, the same odds as running across a homo necrosophiliac, for God's sake. I mean, this is statistically an anomaly. So in that scenario, uh, what would we do? Well, uh, when I was in uh, studying statistics theoretically and practically, getting my PhD, uh, we would do his mister. We would look for a historical explanation. What in the, what in the hell uh, happened? A lot of people were doing peyote in Wisconsin, and you know, there's a lot of it going around and decided, whoa, Trump would be cool. Uh, did, was there any signs of historical intervention that would explain the odd, deviant behavior? Now the other thing, and this is very novel, uh, in the his mister, you have two eyes. The second eye you go to is you say, are my instruments recording properly? Are my machines, are my private, for-profit, proprietary machines that are programmed by strangers, many of them felons, that occasionally <laughs> hop in front of my eyes, could they be not recording? correctly. And then you have these exit polls <laughs> where people are walking out uh, and the exit polls are indicating Hillary Clinton won by six uh, percentage points, but the machines are reading that you know uh, Trump is winning narrowly by a point. Uh, it would not be, those numbers would not be accepted in terms of social science research without scrutiny. Right? And then you'd look at you know, your sample. Are you sampling the right amount of people? Are you measuring the right thing? Is somehow your machine measuring uh, when you push? Or do you have a problem like you had in Ohio, which they admitted to on 31 machines in Mahoning County, where when you push for carry, it jumped to Bush. But again, on the other hand, as they put it, it was only on 31 machines. Okay. So is your measurement correct? Right? And was it implemented right? Right? It, uh, what we're now seeing a lot of, uh, which will be scary, in the, is uh, you know, they're, they're going after the poll books. Right? So the poll books, uh, and what we're seeing, and I think it's a test run, is we couldn't download the software. So 
we have to be, it's like, okay, we don't know whether you can vote or not because our electronic poll books aren't downloaded, right? Uh, this backs up the lines. It does a variety of things. Uh, but it was pointed out, you know, you did this on paper for 100 years. Why don't you have the paper back up there in case the electronic poll books go down? Okay, so uh, that's a novel idea when we look at this. So your implementation, right? You know, can you get the machines up? Can you download the software on the poll book? Ha you know, there's a lot of things uh, that can go wrong. Uh, and then just the technical problems as well as the errors. So uh, I want to look at this based on this thesis just to remind you of a few things uh, historically. Smart device, smart device, and hash X200E. Your permission is required to connect your device to this TV. Allow button. Okay, yeah. Uh, let's uh, remind you what, what we know about the noble beginnings of electronic uh, voting uh, in America. That is, in 1998, uh, the New Hampshire Republican uh, primary, uh, which the Manchester Union leader said uh, smelled of a CIA. Uh, dark opera uh, operations. Well, the former CIA director was running. Why wouldn't it smell Never. like? In a lot of countries, it's illegal for the, you know, the head of intelligence. Uh, you know, I, uh, doesn't apply to Russia, but does apply, and doesn't apply to the United States. Okay, so uh, you may recall that CIA director George Herbert Walker Bush trailed Dole by eight points in the final uh, polls before the election. But he won by nine points, a unprecedented 17-point shift, unprecedented, uh, historically. And the Washington Post got right on it, right? They said, mm, we weren't predicting an unexplained grassroots uprising in favor of the CIA director. Uh, now, the other thing that I would have looked at is that for the first time, uh, in uh, a primary, we used electronic voting. John Sununu, the governor, had brought in the Shooptronics. Uh, well, we later changed that to Danaher because the guy was convicted twice of election rigging and bribery. So they, they were only made by the best individuals in this case. So 17-point shift, last second from the last field polls, when you're using the machines for the first time. This is only going to be good in the long run. Well, was there anything else to worry about? Well, what about 1988? Ron Saltzman uh, writes, accuracy, integrity, and security in computerized vote tallying for the National Bureau, Bureau of Standards Institute for Computer Science and Technology. He warns, quote, the possibility that unknown persons may perpetrate undiscovered frauds with computer voting. So this is the government immediately warning us when we're using these black boxes uh, and codes. So yeah, and again this was done from the beginning uh, over and over again. 1988? Really? Yeah, 1988, uh, Mr. Uh, Saltzman. Uh, uh, he actually had done an earlier report from 1964 with mainframe computers. Uh, and then he actually did a book on it, but he kept writing and saying, you know, uh, this makes uh, no sense. If I go back a little farther, uh, uh, in 1950, the Bureau of Social Science Research, BSSNR, becomes the leading advocate of electronic voting. Um, Founded as a division of the School of Social Science and Public Affairs at American University. Also in 53 as a nonprofit, it helped the CIA overthrow Mossadegh's government in Iran. So, uh, and was one of the key advocates of the use of computers uh, in the 60s and 70s. Okay, 1974 against Saltman. This is 14 years earlier. 
U.S. General Accounting Office uh, commissions a study. Uh, Saltman uh, gets it done in 75. Again, effective use of computer technology in vote counting. He writes, increasingly computerization of election related functions may result in the loss of effective control over these functions by responsible authorities and that this loss of control may increase the possibility of vote fraud. 1974. See, somebody's talking about vote fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a it's too bad. <laughs> and uh, uh, again, uh, as we look uh, at a variety of these things, these vote counts, uh, you know, uh, it is the strip and flip, uh, and uh, John will say stack as well. But, right, they're already beginning the strip, you know. The 235 uh, will be purged by uh, September 6th. Uh, there's been mass purges over uh, and over again. Uh, we could adopt the European Union approach. It shall be the responsibility of election officials to register their citizens to vote. Uh, our, ours is cool, it's states' rights, it's straight up Jim Crow shit. Uh, 50 states, each with their own uh, decision as to how to purge, throw voters off, uh, or actually obey the law. Uh, and again, uh, Democrats do better the larger the voter turnout, so they generally uh, don't like the massive purges. Uh, so on the other hand, You've got these massive purges. You've got secret software. Uh, and you've got now uh, cutting back on workers. They're systematically gaming the system. They know what, uh, what to do. Uh, and unless we stop them, right, by getting the money, getting out there, re-registering, working with organizations, uh, you know, they've already got it in the position uh, where uh, someone uh, with a very uh, low vote count uh, can, in fact, uh, become the president and say whatever he likes and makes up whatever facts uh, that he's liked. And uh, in Ohio, since I, I just finished my book, uh, can say stuff on, uh, you know, uh, white supremacy, like there's good people on both sides. Um, they, we knew from the beginning there weren't good people on the side of non-transparency and electronic voting. Uh, and uh, the people in this room, many of you, helped fight that. It's going to be a big battle in 2020. Uh, and we have to be resolute uh, in terms of not uh, allowing them uh, first, what they're doing now is to strip the vote. I mean, we really need to directly challenge them and go, why in the hell can't you leave them on the computer? I mean, it's not a, they have to show ID. It makes no sense. And the mainstream media doesn't seem to get that point. Right? It's, they, they just don't get it. Why are you, I mean, when I don't go out and demonstrate, say, in a two-year period, I don't lose my fundamental constitutional right to demonstrate against Donald Trump. Why would you lose your right to vote when you have a computer and you have ID? So let me leave you with that. Yay.